Absolutely. So um, coffee opens so many doors, you know, um, the basics of coffee and hospitality are life skills. And that's something that we're really passionate about at Hub International. It's also confidence. It's been able to communicate. And these are things that whatever industry you go into, you need to be able to do. So coffee is really practical. It's fun. And some of our um, young trainees will decide that they really love being a barista and they'll want to take that and grab it and keep going with it. But others will get to see through this scholarship what it's like to be a roaster do they want to travel do they want to find out about farming whatever that journey looks like ahead because there's so many more careers than just barista okay. which is also a fantastic career itself great thank you very much uh, mary strom there from humber international for joining us we certainly know a lot about coffee on this program do we get through enough of it we do, we we do. yeah we keep the industry going well i have to say now kenny crawford coffee or otherwise is here with the sport yes plenty to keep us on our toes tonight because we'll be building up to a match of real significance throughout the day here on bbc radio scotland queens park versus partick thistle in the premiership playoff quarter final second leg tonight at 7 45 live on the bbc scotland channel thistle lead 4-3 on aggregate um, at the moment and hopefully another goal fest this evening will be joined after one o'clock by an avid queens park fan who will be going to Oakle View tonight. He's been following them for over 20 years. Also a big night for Clyde and East Fife in the second leg of their League One playoff semi-final second leg. Clyde lead that one 1-0. One That's tonight. As for tomorrow, the top flight drama looks to be at Tannadice. Dundee United third bottom on 31 points. Host Ross County bottom on 30 points. Here's United boss Jim Goodwin. You know, four games to go, four massive games to go, and there's huge significance on every single one of them. And um, you know, the players are in a great place. We've not been too hard on them uh, after the result on Saturday. We, you know, analysed it back and recognised the areas that we need to do a bit better in. And um, if we can do that this weekend, then we give ourselves a, a great chance of getting back to winning ways. Ross County had a good win last weekend. We'll hear from Malky Mackay later on in the programme. The PFA Scotland Manager of the Year nominees are out. Sterling Albion's Darren Young, Dunfermline's James McPaik and St Mirren's Stephen Robinson are vying with Celtic's Ange Postacoglu for that award. That's all for now. Thank you very much, uh, Kenny. I'm designated myself for an honorary Partick fan, I think, for tonight. And then back to County, obviously, for the big game tomorrow. <laughs> um, what you're listening to, Lunchtime Live. The time is now half past 12. Let's go. On digital radio. FM. Your smart speaker. And online. BBC Radio Scotland. Well, it's time for news and sport for the borders with David Knox. Good afternoon. Councillors are being asked to back plans for a final half million pounds refurbishment of their headquarters at Newtown St Boswells, despite more than four-fifths of the staff based there working from home. Colin Colthorne. Reports. Scottish Borders Council's already spent more than £2 million on a refurbishment programme at its Newton St Boswell's headquarters since 2020 to create modern office spaces as well as a new open plan reception and dining area. And last month, members of the ruling executive were asked to rubber stamp a further £480,000 to create a new training suite and civic zone. But former leader David Parker is out after his pre-meeting walk around the building had revealed that almost all offices were empty. The following week, independent councillor James Anderson forced the authority into revealing that only around 60 of the 400 members of staff who were based at the headquarters still used the building, with the rest working from home. Infrastructure Director John Curry will ask councillors on the executive once again next Tuesday to approve the next phase of refurbishments. He states that NHS Borders is already relocating around 60 staff members from the Learning Disability Service to the headquarters with talks ongoing with the Health Board, Live Borders, Police Scotland, Scottish Futures Trust and Borders Community Action over further relocations. Police are appealing for witnesses after two caravans were stolen from the same security yard at Cloven Fords near Gala Shales. The first caravan, a unicorn, was reported stolen on Saturday despite it being fitted with wheel locks and the second caravan, an Eldis Alvante 550, which also had locks fitted, was reported stolen from the same yard on Wednesday. Anyone who witnessed anything suspicious in or around the storage yard is asked to call 101. 
The Scottish Parliament has been told that more help and services for tackling mental health problems are required in rural areas such as the borders. Conservative MSP for Ettrick, Roxburgh and Berwickshire, Rachel Hamilton, gained cross-party consensus after raising the issue at Holyrood. Ms Hamilton said the need for wellbeing support is greatest in rural areas. Like others across Scotland, they experience depression, suicidal thoughts and feelings, self-harming behaviour and anxiety, no matter their age, gender or location. But on top of that, remoteness, isolation and small town stigma can exacerbate these problems. As can the occupational challenges of rural workers. Take gamekeepers, for example, who face vitriol and abuse on a daily basis for simply doing their jobs, looking after the countryside. Well, among the many MSPs who agreed that more needs to be done was SNP regional member Emma Harper. As an MP covering a large rural area, Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish Borders, I'm aware of the challenges rurality can pose. I'm also aware, as the motion states, of the increased challenges that our farming community face, the Ukraine war and the cost crisis. They've all added increased stress, as well as leaving the EU. This has already been said, but it's worth worth repeating that the evidence does show us that people in rural Scotland are more likely than others to experience depression, suicidal thoughts and feelings, self-harming behaviour and anxiety, no matter their age, gender or location. Coast Guards from Eyemouth, Berwick and Dunbar took part in a dramatic rescue of a family dog yesterday. The pet had fallen from cliffs near Eyemouth Golf Club. Following the operation, which involved a rope technician being lowered to the animal, the dog was reunited with its owner. Sport now and Borders has a new world champion. Julie Forrest from Hoyk has added to her impressive trophy haul by winning the world indoor title in Australia earlier this morning. Looking ahead and in rugby, the Jed Forest Sevens take place at Riverside Park tomorrow. Despite leading the Kings of the Sevens table, Melrose's Struan Hutchison admits it's going to be a tight run in. The squad are really looking forward to getting back together this weekend to compete at the Jed Sevens. The squad's full of confidence, eight points clear of Gala, uh, who currently sit behind us in the Kings of the Sevens tournament so we know that they're going to be looking to try and catch up first up for us we've got Watsonians who we we narrowly beat at at Berwick Sevens uh, earlier on in the series we know what challenges and threats they're going to bring and they're currently joint third in Kings of the Sevens so it's certainly going to be a a tough opening game for us in football Vale Leitham travel to Oakley United and Coldstream visit Burn Island in the second division Hoyt Royal Albert are away to Edinburgh South Tweedmouth Rangers are at home to Thornton Hibs and People Rovers travel to East House's Lily the cricket season is well underway now and in the East League Championship Gala travel to Linlithgow Selkirk and Kelso lead the second division and they are away to Carrollton and Royal High Kostorfin seconds respectively leaders Hoyk and Wilton visit Murrayfield Daffs in Division 3 where St Boswell's host Muir. Good luck to all of them this weekend Now for the Borders weather with all the details here's Gillian Smart Hello there, it'll be mainly dry this afternoon Grey skies at first, giving way to brightness later as cloud lifts and breaks especially during the second half of the afternoon to allow some sunny spells highs of 12 to 15 Celsius Tonight will be dry with some patchy mist and fog, lows of 2 to 5 Celsius. And tomorrow mist and fog may be slow to clear in places, but otherwise it will be a fine day with warm sunny spells and highs of 17 to 20 Celsius. BBC Radio Scotland weather for the borders. Get the latest news on your smart speaker whenever you want. Just say, play BBC News for Scotland. You're listening to Lunchtime Live with Hayley Miller and Andrew Black. 24 minutes to one now. Calmax chartered catamaran MV Alfred has made its first West Coast crossing this morning on the Ardrossan to Arran route. The Scottish Government is paying £9 million to loan the boat for nine months, say, from Orkney's Pentland ferries. The catamaran set sail just after 11 and our reporter Gillian Sharp was on it. She joins us now. So how was the crossing, Gillian? Well, Healy, I have to say it was a bit of a treat, really. Not at all what I was expecting when I came into work this morning. Weather was lovely, a very smooth crossing. Took about an hour from um, Ardrossan into Harbour at um, Brodick, where I'm speaking to you from now. And I'm looking just at the Pentland Ferries catamaran, uh, a long-awaited vessel finally in service. Yeah, well, indeed, the islanders on the West Coast have been waiting a long time to get some uh, more uh, support for the, the services, which have become, you know, pretty unreliable of late. 
Yes, I mean, this um, cataram catamaran was due to be in service on this route last month, but it was hit by delays, so islanders and tourists alike have had to wait uh, even longer for it. They have had one vessel, one of the more traditional Kalmat ferries operating this route. We passed it on the way over, but today with the MV Alfred in service, it brings that number up to two, and it just brings a bit more uh, flexibility in, into the service. Um, and we've been speaking to Sally Campbell, who's with the Aran Ferries Action Group, and she says this is really a welcome addition. It's rare but good news after a very challenging winter, spring, and now early summer. It's been very difficult for Aran. And Aran is, is open for business. It's actually kept going, and there's huge relief um, for residents. Uh, for the businesses, that includes obviously our vital tourism business, but also our agriculture and whiskey distilleries, and even for oil deliveries and our food lorry drivers. Well, Gillian, this boat isn't able to be used on Calmax Isla service just yet, so will it remain um, from Ordrossen to Aran? Well, um, Calmax is saying that they hope in the future it will be able to, to be used on that Isla um, route. But first, they need to sort some technical issues. It's something to do with the starboard thruster, uh, whatever that may mean. Um, and that will be sorted, they say, by Pentland Ferries. Um, Calmac have said that the addition of the MV Alfred is bringing much needed support to local communities here. Yeah, and no doubt the Scottish Government will be hoping that it proves to be a good use of public money. Um, cer certainly, they, they've um, put out uh, £9 million to um, lease this less vessel over the next nine months, and it's all about building some much-needed resilience into the system. Gillian, good to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. Gillian Sharp there, who's been on that uh, first crossing on the new uh, catamaran MV Alfred. Well, let's go to Turkey now, where people are getting ready to vote in the country's presidential election. The incumbent, President Erdogan, is under pressure because of a severe economic crisis which has hit the country. Uh, let's speak to the journalist Emily Wither, who's in Istanbul. Um, so, uh, Emily, two kind of main candidates in this presidential election. We've got President er Erdogan, uh, the incumbent, and then his opponent, who's been backed by a number of opposition parties. Um, any indications as to to who might be in front. Hello, Emily. Ah, well, I think we seem to have lost uh, Emily um, with her there. Uh, oh, we've got her back. Uh, can you hear us okay, Emily? Yes, I can ah, hear you. Ah, right, okay, we've got you now, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so first of all, um, any indications then as to who might be out in front in this presidential election? So there was a really interesting development yesterday, an 11th hour shake-up in these elections where one of the candidates, Muramam Inje, he dropped out of the election, which ha has probably boosted the opposition leader, Kamal Kalic to Orlu. Polls are now showing that he is in the lead in these elections. However, he might not get the more than 50% that is required for an outright win. And that would mean that the, these elections would then go to a second round. But as I say, Kalich to Orlu is looking like he is in the lead right now. And that would mark an historic turning point for this country. President Erdogan has been in power here for more than 20 years. And what he is offering this country is a very different direction to what the opposition is offering. So either way, whoever wins, this is a turning point for this country. It's either going to choose to remain under one man rule. It will tighten Erdogan's authoritarian, increasingly authoritarian regime, or the opposition, Kalich to Orlu, will take Turkey in a very different direction. It's promised to strengthen democracy, freedom of speech here. It's promised to return the country back to a parliamentary system. So for Turks going out to vote this weekend, they, they really are making a choice here about what they want the future of their country to look like. And do we know what people in Turkey actually want um, the, 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 future, the future of their country to look like? Well, that's a great question because the country is so polarised. You know, as I said before, both candidates are polling both at 40 something percent. So it just shows that there are two very strong competing visions here. It is worth pointing out, though, that 
while these elections, it's mostly felt, felt will be free, the question is, are they fair? And in Turkey, they're not really fair when you look at the media landscape here, for example. Over 90% of the media is now controlled by the government. If you insult the president in this country, you go to jail for it. So that's just how difficult the media landscape is and that means that information doesn't get to everyone in the public. In this country stats show that over 80% of people don't read a foreign language so most people are getting their news from government sources and that does